saw it. Introduction Mr. Ed was a TV series character, based on the common expression of hearing straight from the horse's mouth. Mr. Ed was a popular American television series that aired from 1961 to 1966. It featured a talking horse named Mr. Ed and his owner, Wilbur Post. The show had a total of 143 episodes over six seasons. There is a lot more to the expression hear it straight from the horse's mouth that has to do with the topic of this video than you might think. There has been, and still currently is, a tremendous amount of intentional disinformation concerning the Book of Revelation in general, and especially the prophecies, that constitute the area of theology, known as Biblical Eschatology. Primarily originating from the two previously mentioned schemes of eschatology known as Jesuit, Preterism and Futurism. Both of which, were by design, to deflect, the very clear warnings in the Book of Revelation, to Christians. Most Christians are not aware, when they see and hear these schemes, that the disinformation campaign was actually, a fully intentional effort, from its inception, and still continues to be, into our current day. When this disinformation effort comes to chapter 16, it is faced, once again, with the need to deflect everything in the book of Revelation, and especially, the use of the term, Babylon in these texts, as a reference to Rome. Because if these references are seen to be a reference to Rome, especially in the context of modern-day biblical prophecies, then all these judgments have the Roman papacy as their target. And since that is their primary benefactor, every mental gymnastic to get these prophecies away from Rome are used, even to the extent of comical extremes, no matter how unjustified or mangled the text becomes in order to achieve that goal. So, before we can conclude the final video on Chapter 16, involving the Seventh Saucer Judgment, we are going to have to address, why Babylon is clearly a reference to Rome, beyond any reasonable doubt. And the very best way to do that, is to let the viewers of this video, hear it straight from the horse's mouth. In Antichrist for Dummies, Part 20, earlier, on Revelation Chapter 9, we introduced the expression in English, that Counter-Reformation eschatology was bankrupt of, quote, horse sense, end quote. To point out, that it completely ignored, the obvious common sense, of the text, in Revelation chapter 9. Including, quite literally, about its subject on horses. In which John, specifies, that the horses he is describing, in chapter 9, have manes like lions. Or, in other words, very long horse manes. Which narrows his description down, to one unmistakable reference of horses. Which counter-reformation eschatology, completely intentionally ignores both preterism and futurism alike. So thus, these eschatologies, have no, horse sense, at all. The pun on the words, is fully intended. And is an easy way to remember, the huge mistakes, both preterism and futurism make, in Revelation 9, that expose them as fraudulent examples of disinformation. Here in chapter 16, this video is going to use another idiomatic expression in English, because you are going to see that Babylon, was used as a reference to Rome, and you are going to hear it, straight from the horse's mouth. While this video will not feature any literal talking horses, you will see the next best thing. We will see, the very clear historical context, of both early Romans and Jews, routinely using the term Babylon to mean Rome. And you will see why, from the New Testament itself, John intended no other meaning, than that very usage. And you will hear it, literally, straight from the horse's own mouth. Coming straight from the horse's mouth, is an old expression in English. 
It originated between 1890 and 1910. The idiom straight from the horse's mouth originated in British horse racing circles. The idiom means that the information comes from a reliable source, such as a tipster with inside information. For example, when people were placing bets on horse races, those with the best information were those closest to the racers. The idiom may have originated in the context of inside information about the condition of horse in an impending horse race. For example, when buying a horse, some sellers would lie about the horse's age. But, despite the misrepresentation created by the seller, a close inspection of the horse itself could be made. The buyer, rather than blindly trusting the representation of the seller, could easily check on this by looking in the horse's own mouth as to the condition of the horse's teeth. The older the horse was, the more worn the enamel would be on the teeth. So, in other words, the expression came to mean, there is no need to simply trust a claim from a horse seller, when you could inspect the horse's mouth, and see for yourself. In other words, you can hear it from those, who are directly involved. Or quote, straight from the horse's mouth, end quote. When early Romans and Jews themselves identify, Babylon, in the book of Revelation is referring to Rome, that is an example of the idiom, of coming straight from the horse's mouth. And it also can be used to remember, the importance of the primary source documentation of the New Testament, over religious speculations and contortions, that meet certain economic political theological imagined goals. <laughs> primary source documentation refers to original and unmediated sources of information that provide first-hand, direct evidence or data about a particular event, person, object, or period of time. These sources are created at the time of the event or by individuals who directly witnessed or participated in it. Primary sources are valuable for historical research, academic study, and various fields because they offer a direct and often unfiltered perspective on a subject. <laughs> Primary source documentation is highly valuable in historical research and various fields, including journalism, social sciences, and academic research. Primary sources provide first-hand, original, or direct evidence of an event, person, object, or period of time. They are crucial for several reasons including but not limited to. 1. Authenticity and credibility, primary sources offer the most direct and unmediated information. They are created at the time of the event or by individuals who experienced or witnessed it, making them more credible and less susceptible to bias or distortion. 2. Contextual understanding, primary sources provide context and a deeper understanding of historical events, people, and cultures. They can reveal the motivations, attitudes, and perspectives of those involved. 3. Historical accuracy, they help in verifying and fact-checking historical accounts and can challenge or corroborate existing narratives. 4. Unique insights, primary sources can reveal unique details, personal stories, and nuances that might be lost in secondary sources or summaries. The use of primary source documentation can be characterized by the idiomatic expression here it straight from the horse's mouth. Just as the idiom suggests, getting information directly from the most reliable and first-hand source, primary source documentation provides information directly from the individuals or sources that were directly involved in or witnessed historical events. It's like hearing the information straight from the source, which is often the most credible and unmediated way to understand the past. So. The expression aligns with the idea that primary sources offer the most authentic and direct insights into historical events and contexts. In this video, we will examine the primary source documentation involving the use of Babylon to refer to the city of Rome by John, where the seventh saucer judgment will, as you will see, no doubt occur in history. The Seventh Saucer Judgment The Seventh Saucer Judgment is described in Revelation chapter 16, verse 17 through 21, and reads as follows in our reconstructed translation of the Textus Receptus, quote, And the seventh messenger poured his saucer into the air and the great voice came forth from the dwelling in heaven, from the throne, saying, Cause to be. And there came sounds and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake came such as not has come from the time men have been upon the land, such an earthquake so great, 
and the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the Gentiles fell and Babylon the great, was remembered in the sight of God, to give her the cup of the wine of the wrath of his anger. And every manner of island vanished and mounts were not found. And great hail talent like in weight fell out of the sky upon the men, and they blasphemed the god of the plague because great was the plague of its violence. End quote. Understanding the role of sacred propaganda. In this text, there are two explicit references to a particular city. John is, not, describing events which happen all over the world, as is claimed by counter-reformation futurists. As shown previously, there has been a massive amount of intentional disinformation about these texts, much of which, has not only been anti-scientific, but completely fantastical and ridiculous, to the extreme that it qualifies as superstition, because it is unfounded in the biblical text itself and is blatantly contradicted by the science of physics, and so, it is also completely unrealistic. And the fact that billions of dollars have completely convinced the overwhelming Christian population that these fantasies are true is a testament to the effectiveness of an indoctrination or a brainwashing propaganda campaign being intentionally waged against them in keeping with the office of sacra propaganda or in English as sacred propaganda. If you Google the question, what is sacred propaganda, you will be given the answer, quote, the sacred congregation de propaganda fide, de, whose official title is, Sacra Congregatio Cristiano Nomini Propagando, is the department of the pontifical administration, charged with the spread of Catholicism, and with the regulation of ecclesiastical affairs, in non-Catholic countries. End quote. That very generic definition belies the fact, that this office, also embraced the advice of John Chrysostom, who extolled the practice of deception, and counseled it should be considered an admirable virtue. So, in the propagation of the Catholic faith by this office, deception was, and still is, considered a virtue. Which became the basis, of what disinformation propaganda, really is. And thus, why we have so much of it, in current American culture. Years ago, in 2013, when the video series on terrorism on this channel, was being researched, in which this channel was showing how Alex Jones and Waleed Shabat were being used to create propaganda, for the counter-reformation, this page concerning propaganda, was found on the internet. It was found researching the definition of the concept, and term, propaganda. It was a website page, created by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, on the historical origin of the word, propaganda. The article explained, that quote, it took on a new meaning in the 17th century when the papacy established a special division within the Catholic Church, the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, or Propaganda Fide, to systematically spread Catholic doctrine throughout the world, to win new converts, and stem the rising tide of Protestantism. End quote. It can no longer be found today, ten years later. Propaganda, was in its earliest and original form, sabotage lies, spread by the Counter-Reformation, against Protestantism in Europe. Because the Roman Catholic Church did not see lying as a moral sin, but a moral duty. As described by, the prophesied liar himself, John Chrysostom. Who said it was not a sin, but a virtue, worthy of all admiration. And that is precisely what the Vatican has done, throughout history, including, into today's, present-day America. Most of these lies offered by so-called conspiracy theorists, are done entirely for political cover, for the Vatican's goal, to subjugate the world's governments, including the United States, to the Vatican, or simply replace them, as the case may be. So, they actually hide real conspiracies, for political action and defense, by creating conspiracy theories, to use as deflections, from what is actually, or really, going on. As we have pointed out, not incidentally, the majority of wealth in the United States, is now owned by the Catholic Church. Thanks to the political work, of these same counter-reformation propagandists. Operating in the realm, of both pseudo-American politics, and pseudo-evangelical religion. Both names, that it actually betrays. In the realm of theology, they have intentionally censored, all avenues of contact with the public, of the historicist interpretation of eschatology, which began with Oxford and C.I. Schofield, and taken up years later, with William Hurst and Billy Graham. When dealing with the Seventh Saucer Judgment, 
in chapter 16, verses 17 through 21, the text makes mention of quote, the great city, and, Babylon the great. And here, these references are said to be anything but Rome. Of course. Because that, is what the hoax theology of Jesuit futurism and preterism, and its counter-reformationists, are actually working for. So naturally, they can never admit what it means, nor tolerate any knowledge, among the general public, on why it means that. So that is naturally, what you will need to see, first. This video will explain that it does mean Rome, and why it is an unmistakable reference. While this information may seem redundant to our long-time viewers, this section, will introduce some facts, that have never previously been discussed, but will once again illustrate how stupid you have to be, to swallow the false claims by futurists, and preterists, that it doesn't mean, what it obviously means. First, let's review the history of how the text was interpreted, by biblical scholars from every background before the Rupert Murdochian Counter-Reformation historical rewrites, on the History Channel, to make it all go away. And secondly, let's review, how secular professors and sources understood it and still understand, that reference, even in spite of our post rupert Murdochian rewrites of religious history, on the History Channel, to make it all go away. And thirdly, let's review, what we know from the whole of the scriptures, itself, in a brief survey from the very first book in the New Testament, to the very end, in the book of Revelation, and everything in between. And if after all that, you still prefer to believe the hoax theology of futurism and preterism instead, you will probably fully deserve, what you will get. Which is a delusion. And fourthly, let's review how the text, and its use of the phrase Babylon, or Mystery Babylon, was understood by Romans themselves, and by Jews, who used that expression. Because after all, John as we have previously shown, was a Jew. And even if you for some very very strange reason, thought he was a Roman Catholic, then it would still argue, that is what he meant. It would still not get Rome, off the hook, as his reference in Revelation chapter 13, 14, 16, 17 and 18, even then. 1. The real history of the Antichrist, survey from history. 2. Secular professors and secular sources. 3. The entire context of the New Testament. And. 4. First century Romans and Jews, themselves. Out of their own mouths. Before the Reformation. 1412, John Huss, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. During the Reformation. 1522, Martin Luther, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1536, William Tyndale, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1543, Philip Melanchthon, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1545, Andreas Osiander, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1550, John Bales, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1554, Nicholas von Amsdorf, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1554, Nicholas Ridley, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1558, Johann Funk, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1560, Virgil Solis, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1557, Heinrich Bullinger, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1562, John Jewell, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1582, Thomas Cranmer, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1593, John Napier, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1604, Georges Picard, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1614, Thomas Brightman, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1618, David Parius, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1618, Matthias von Honegg, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1618, Daniel Kramer, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1631, Joseph Mead, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. 1643, Johannes Gerhard, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. After the Reformation. 1655, John Tillinghast, 
Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1670, William Sherwin, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1681, John Heinrich Ousted, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1687, Pierre Jurieu, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1689, Drew Cressener, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1701, Johannes Coxias, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1703, Charles Dobbins, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1727, Sir Isaac Newton, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1735, Thomas Pyle, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1740, Johann Bengel, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1754, Thomas Newton, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1764, John Wesley, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1794, Joseph Priestley, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome, 1798, Richard Valpy, Mystery Babylon equals Papal Rome. Four entire centuries of consistent biblical interpretation from Catholic, to Anglican, to Lutheran, to Evangelical, biblical scholars, all concluding unanimously, the prophecies in Revelation, prophesying Mystery Babylon, without controversy, equaled, Papal Rome. And there is more than enough evidence to have made that view, a consistent interpretation, prior to the advent of Jesuit Futurism, and Preterism. <laughs> Secular Sources Counter-Reformationists need all the references in the Book of Revelation, to Babylon and Mystery Babylon, to refer to something else, despite, that this reference is completely obvious to honest biblical scholars, and have been that way, for literally centuries. The reason this is the case, is that these substitute references are found replete in non-biblical historical sources. And, they are even cited by historical era commentaries. John Gill wrote in John Gill's Exposition of the Bible, quote, Rome Papal, called Babylon the Great, Revelation 16.5, and so the Alexandrian copy, the Vulgate Latin, Syriac and Arabic versions, read here. So Rome is called Babel in some ancient writings of the Jews, where some copies read Babel, others read Rome. And Tertullian, who wrote long before the appearance of the Romish Antichrist, says, with our John, Babylon is a figure of the Roman city, end quote. Albert Barnes, wrote in Albert Barnes' notes on the Bible, that quote, all the circumstances require us to understand this of Rome. End quote. The Greek scholar, A.T. Robertson, wrote in A.T. Robertson's word pictures in the Greek New Testament, quote, Babylon the Great, Babylon he Megali. The adjective, Megali, occurs with Babylon, each time in the Apocalypse, Revelation 14.8, 16.19, 17.5, 18.2, 18.10, and 18.21, as a reminder of Nebuchadnezzar. There is no doubt, that Rome is meant by Babylon. As a prisoner in Patmos, John could speak his mind by this symbolism. End quote. The second source of confirmation, that these texts do indeed refer to Rome, beyond just the universal testimony of history, is that it is also known to secular and Catholic sources, as well. And, it is not controversial. Professor Bergen Pearson has a BA in Classical Languages from Uppsala College in East Orange, New Jersey. A Bachelor of Divinity in Biblical Studies and Theology from Pacific Theological Seminary in Berkeley, California. An MA in Greek from the University of California, Berkeley. And a PhD in New Testament and Christian Origins from Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Pearson was elected a member of the Catholic Biblical Association in 1978. His professional affiliation as an elected member of the Catholic Biblical Association puts him squarely in the theological camp of counter-reformationists. Nine years after his election to the Catholic Biblical Association, he wrote an article for the LA Times, as Professor of Religious Studies, for the University of California, Santa Barbara, in which he states, quote, the quotations in the article from the Book of Revelation in the New Testament, Revelation 17 5, 18, 21 and 22, speak of Babylon, but in fact Babylon is a code name for Rome. In Jewish apocalyptic literature of the period after the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple by the Romans in 70, Rome is often equated symbolically with Babylon, 
whose forces destroyed the first temple in 586 BC. This parallelism lies behind such apocalypses as 4 Ezra and 2 Baruch, and the name Babylon is used specifically to refer to Rome in the Sibylline Oracles, 5143, as well as 4 Ezra 1546. The Book of Revelation in the New Testament follows this pattern, referring to Rome, the Great City, chapter 17 verse 18, with its seven hills, chapter 17 verse 9, under the code name, Babylon. End quote. If you Google the question, why was Rome referred to as Babylon? Google AI will explain the following, quote, In Jewish apocalyptic literature of the period, after the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple, by the Romans in 70 AD, Rome is often equated symbolically with Babylon, whose forces destroyed the first temple, in 586 BC. End quote. The information that leads to the conclusion that Babylon means Rome, is found both, in the biblical text, and in written secular history. So that Babylon, was the standard usage of the term, to refer to Rome, is not an opinion, it is an historical fact. No matter what your personal theology, or eschatology, happens to be. And the only two options you have in light of this fact, is that you can create a fantasy you call eschatology, that denies what it meant when it was written by the author, referring to what it meant to the author, or you can replace what he wrote with your own personal theological fantasies, or excuses. Next, you will see that the entire historical context of the New Testament, also supports this factual observation. The New Testament itself give number of prophecy on the chart. In the first section concerning the consensus of history, you saw that there was no confusion over what mystery Babylon referred to in the text, since at least the 1400s, a full six centuries ago. In the second section, you saw that, extra-biblical evidence all point to the use of Babylon as a reference to Rome, after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. John Gill pointed out that the associated use of Babylon was so customary to mean Rome among Jews and early Christians, and was so frequent, that it was actually found in place of the word Babylon, in the texts, of some early manuscripts, and Jewish writings. Albert Barnes of Princeton Theological Seminary, stated, quote, all the circumstances require us to understand this of Rome. End quote. The noted Greek scholar, A.T. Robertson, stated, quote, there is no doubt, that Rome is meant by Babylon, end quote. And the secular, Berger Pearson, member of the Catholic Biblical Association, and who is the Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara and Professor and Interim Director of the Religious Studies Program at the University of California, Berkeley, stated, quote, Babylon is used specifically to refer to Rome. So, to surmise, 1. The terms, Babylon and Rome were used interchangeably in manuscript copies and writings. 2. It was acknowledged as such by even Rome's own Latin fathers. 3. These historical facts were cited by secular university professors. 4. In Greek scholarship, concluded, there was no doubt that Babylon in the Greek text was a derogatory or cloak, reference to Rome. But, preterists and futurists, have to get something other than papal Rome, from the texts, that clearly identify Papal Rome in chapter upon chapter of specific and unmistakable historical descriptions. So, let the games begin. And whenever there is a slightest controversy involving any country, city or religion on earth other than Rome, they then become the latest substitution for Mystery Babylon. But in reality, there is not now, nor has there ever been, any mystery, to what the term Mystery Babylon, actually was. And they have no help from the scriptures. Evidence in the biblical text, involve the language and grammar. Language and grammar facts, are concrete. And they are verifiable to anyone, who wants to verify it. Everyone is forced to see the same thing, even if you don't really want to see it. First myth about the New Testament, is that all the material about the traditional understood Antichrist as a Roman papacy, does not all come from the book of Revelation only. If you look at the chart, on your screen, these are all the New Testament books and chapters, that mention material that are traditionally understood, as being about the prophecies concerning the New Testament Antichrist. It is more than 50% of the entire New Testament. So, it is purely a case, of biblical illiteracy, 
that cause counter-reformationists to commonly maintain, this all just comes from misinterpreting the book of Revelation. If you lopped off the book of Revelation entirely off from the rest of the New Testament, you would still get the to the very same conclusion that reformers came to prior to, during, and after the Reformation. Especially, when you examine those other references to the subject matter in the New Testament. The reason for this, is that they are all indirectly, referencing Rome. And we will actually look at some examples of that in a minute. The chart, you see on your screen, illustrates why Rome is so frequently implicated, in these other New Testament texts. This is a chart showing the most frequently specifically mentioned cities, in the New Testament. In the upper left-hand column is the list of most frequently mentioned cities by name. To the upper right of the chart is the most frequently mentioned municipalities, or countries, by way of reference to national origin or ethnicity. In the center of the chart, is the results of the combined results for both national or municipal origin and the outright reference, for cities in the New Testament. What you see in the result of this study, is that the most referenced cities on earth, outside of Judea, is the east and west capital of the Roman Empire. But that's not all, you can see. Under the label of context, shown at the top, is a column in light orange, showing what geopolitical entity, each city that is mentioned, is governed by. And as you will also see, every city that is mentioned, is a possession of the Roman Empire. And that geopolitical context in history, is what all of the books, contained in the New Testament, were all written under. Both the eastern capital of Roman Empire, in the city of Antioch is frequently mentioned, and the western capital of the Roman Empire, in the city of Rome is also just as frequently mentioned. In fact, outside of the Roman province of Judea, no other city is mentioned more than the combined references to Rome and Antioch. The second most frequently mentioned city is Ephesus, which was a Roman municipia, which was a very important imperial city, in the Roman Empire, which was granted a level of self-governance and autonomy, in exchange for their heightened esteem and loyalty. The next chart on your screen, shows the geographical context, of the flow of 30 major prophecies given throughout the entire New Testament, beginning with the book of Matthew, and ending with the book of Revelation. This list is just a sample of examples, and is no means exhaustive. But to show the continued consistency, of the target of these prophecies, it will give you a good idea, of how the New Testament builds the eschatological case, line by line, and prophecy by prophecy, against the Roman Empire. The first seven prophecies constitute about one quarter of the example prophecies shown, and those are in other parts of the New Testament, other than the book of Revelation. The historical context of the first example, all about Rome. In prophecy number one, on your chart, on your screen. The first prophetic example is beginning from Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 23 and then again in chapter 10, verse 16 through 33, in Christ's prophecy about false prophets. These texts contain detailed events about not only the coming of false prophets, but the persecution they will generate against his true disciples. The prophecies constitute approximately 25 verses in Matthew, in two different chapters. And the historical context, which can be seen, in both sections, is Rome. The first section details the coming of a substitute religion that will claim to be coming in his name, and be for him. It will constitute a majority of believers on earth. And on judgment day, he will deny he ever knew them. The second, part of the prophecy is that these same false prophets, will generate intense persecution against his true disciples, both among the Gentiles, and among the Jews. Both prophecies, incidentally, came to pass historically, with graphic accuracy. The historical context, illustrates how these texts emerged, and guide the reader's interpretation of them into the light of day, into an unmistakable understanding of what Christ was saying to his disciples. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 states, quote, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Most people in Christianity, think they know exactly what this means. But, actually the point of the prophecy is completely missed, by most, because of the missing historical context. The obvious elements are that false prophets are wolves in sheep's clothing, and will devour the sheep which is a famous saying among Christians, that can be as easily quoted, as the familiar text, of John 3.16. But what is rarely quoted, is what it meant to first century Judeans. 
the Roman money, during Christ's time, featured the iconic legend of a she-wolf suckling the abandoned Romulus and Remus, who were said to be the founders of Rome. The motif, was republished by every succeeding emperor throughout the duration of the Roman Empire, into as late as the 5th century AD. They were issued in numerous coinage denominations featuring every metallic material thing from bronze coins, to silver coins, and even to the most expensive gold coins. On the top right, the coins featuring the wolf, depicted in this corner commemorate, the Christian Emperor Constantine the Great, who ruled from 307 to 337 AD, 300 years after the time of Christ. These coins were so common in the ancient world, might find them in the range of $10 to $50 or even lower, depending on the specific coin and its condition. When a Judean look in his hand, at donating money to a religious leader, he would look down at his coins, and see the Roman wolf, that nurtured Romulus and Remus, who founded the Roman Empire. The message was clear at what the false prophets were going to want, and how they were going to devour the sheep. It was a strong warning against peddling religion for money. False prophets are motivated by the prophet motive of money, not the prophet's motive of God. It was a consistent theme throughout the Gospels. But aside from its clear warning about how false prophets would be economically motivated, it was also a theological warning about their theology as well. That it would be coming from the Roman Empire, and not what he was teaching his disciples. In the Roman legend of Romulus and Remus being nurtured by a she-wolf, the god of wolves, was also known to be Apollo. Apollo was the personification of the sun, born ritualistically, on December 25th. A coin featuring Apollo Lycaeus, the wolf god, was also produced by the Roman Empire, around 150 BC. The coin is commemorating the prayer to Apollo. Quote, And you Apollo, lord of the wolf, be a wolf to the enemy force, and give them groan for groan. The first officially instituted Christmas, enacted by Pope Sixtus III, or 666, was at a shrine in Rome, known as the Lupercale, which was a tribute to Romulus and Remus legend of being nurtured by the wolf of Apollo. Christ couldn't have made himself more explicit in his warnings about the coming false prophets, what will motivate them, and what theological corruptions they will introduce to the sheep. He goes on with his warning in Matthew 7 verse 21 through 23, stating that quote, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, had we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is the very first warning about what will grow into the prophetic eschatology concerning the Antichrist, 666, the beast, and his associated false prophet, the false sign of bringing fire down from heaven. Which are all explained in the video on this channel about Revelation 13. Matthew 7 is the very first text in the New Testament concerning this issue. And its context, is clearly, about Rome. Fast forward 24 texts later in the Bible, to Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, we have the last prophecy issued by John before the seventh saucer judgment prophecy, about a coming earthquake. In verse 13, it is a prophecy about a change in the doctrine of God, that there would be three unclean spirits like frogs, that would go out to the kings of the empire. That happened in the Edict of Thessalonica, and also, by the way, fulfilled the prophecy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, concerning the man of sin would be revealed in Thessalonica, speaking over everything called God or that is worship, as God. This was clearly about Rome as well. And in chapter 16, verse 19, John once again, refers to Babylon, the great city, and its blasphemous substitute wine, that provokes the wrath of God from heaven, and according to chapter 14, verse 10, will eternally damn all those, who even dare to participate in drinking it. This too, is clearly about Rome, once again. From the very first, to the very last, these texts warning of pseudo-Christians, and false prophets, are throughout the entire Bible, warning about a single coming series of events, that would deceive the whole empire. And that is seen throughout the context of the entire New Testament. The Nicolaitans, the man of sin, the Antichrist, 
666, The Warming About Wolves in Sheep's Clothing, from Matthew to Revelation, from the beginning to the end of the New Testament, Rome is central to it all. The historical context of the second example, all about Rome. The second example is not on your chart, but on your screen, and it too, is not a part of the book of Revelation. In the New Testament, in 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, which is not in Revelation, Paul prophesies in detail, stating quote, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. If you Google the question, which Christian denomination require celibacy, you will get, quote, celibacy for religious and monastics monks and sisters nuns and for bishops is upheld by the Catholic Church in the traditions of both Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy. Bishops must be unmarried men or widowers. A married man cannot become a bishop. End quote. These are all branches of the Roman Catholic Church. In the New Testament, the qualification for any Christian bishop is that they have to actually be married. So that fact proves that Rome's so-called church councils were not attended by a single Christian bishop. The entire Roman Catholic Church was founded on celibate bishops who forbade marriage, precisely as Paul prophesied and taught doctrines of devils, and also later, as pointed out by John in Revelation 16 verse 13. This too was clearly about Rome. From the very first warning in the New Testament about false prophets as wolves among the sheep was about Rome. To the warning in 2 Thessalonians about the man of sin and the son of perdition speaking as God over everything that was worshipped or called God was also about Rome. To the warnings about the many antichrists who would deny the flesh of Christ in the Passover meal that were already in Ephesus and the coming Antichrist, that would come to Ephesus, was about Rome. To the Nicolaitans, that forsook the teaching of Christ, for a Gentile Saint Nicholas, that too, was about Rome. And the tribulation that John said he was already in, that would come to the whole empire, which was about Rome. To the four horsemen of the apocalypse, also about Rome. From the 144,000 original Jewish martyrs, who would die on Mount Zion, which was about Rome, to the key from the abyss, that would be given to the Antichrist, also, again, about Rome, from the army like locusts, and stings from scorpions, about Rome, to the throne of the beast, given by the dragon, about Rome, from the false prophet, and the fire from heaven, about Rome, to the very name of the Antichrist, spelled out as literally 666, also about Rome, from the mark of the beast, about Rome, to the restriction of buying and selling, about Rome, from the cup of the wine, that violates and replaces the blood of Christ, about Rome, to the introduction of three unclean spirits like frogs, which were the spirits of devils, which were also, all about Rome. And even all the very excuses to hide these truths, that none of these things, are about Rome, that the New Testament also prophesied as a coming delusion, was also, even all the efforts, to hide the fact, these things were all about Rome, are, all about Rome. So naturally, the last verses, in chapter 16, and in the sixth chapter from the end of the entire Bible, only six chapters from its end, and its use of the term Mystery Babylon in chapter 17, once again, is all about Rome. And based on the grammar of the text, that John penned from his hand, he makes it clear so that none would misunderstand his meaning. He states, speaking of Mystery Babylon, the mother of religious prostitution, quote, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city, which regneth over the kings of the earth. End quote. Why is that unmistakable? because he is referring to his own day. When John was writing this, Jerusalem had already been flattened and destroyed. Babylon, as a city, had fallen into ruin after the time of Alexander and had been relocated to Seleucia under Hellenistic rule. There was no Jerusalem, there was no literal Babylon, and there was no Washington DC. 
and even if there were, which there was not, you still would be able to clearly see John's intended meaning from his grammar. Revelation chapter 17, verse 18, in Young's literal translation, reads, quote, And the woman that thou didst see is the great city that is having reign over the kings of the land. End quote. As you can see from the morphological code, in the inner linear text, the Greek word for ruling or reigns over, is in the Greek present tense, which means it is in the present tense from the author's time. Specifically, in order to make no mistake about the identity of his reference. The city, that mystery Babylon refers to is specifically, the one city, that is having reign, ruling over, present tense, the kings of the land. The present tense specifies which city John is making a reference to. It is the one that is currently reigning, right now in 95 AD, over the kings of the land. Now if you cannot understand, John's reference would have been to one, and only one city in the world, that fits that exact description, you are either very dishonest person, or, you are just really not that bright. Because John leaves no options for creativity or speculation with that description. It is about Rome. Next, the final proof, that John was speaking about Rome, is given from the Romans' own writings themselves. John, in order to once again, make himself perfectly clear about his reference, in using the name Babylon, to actually mean Rome. He does something, he learned from his teacher, as a young disciple, which will be explained in a moment. In chapter 17, where the same text occurs stating that the woman is the city that is ruling over the kings of the land, John unmistakably specifies, what he means by the term Babylon. He states in verse 9, quote, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, on which the woman sitteth. End quote. Most people focus on the part of the verse, that mentions seven mountains. But the most telling part of the verse, is actually the first part, that states, quote, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. End quote. Why did he say that? Because it's true, and it connects his verse to another place in his text, where he first mentioned that expression. Outside of John's use to attribute wisdom, to the Lamb, and in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, to attribute wisdom, also, to God, there are only two other mentions of it in Revelation, using the same language. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, and here in Revelation 17, verse 9, stating quote, here is the mind which hath wisdom. End quote. A lot of people do not have a mind of wisdom, so they generally have no clue who, or what, in both cases, John is talking about, either in Revelation chapter 13 or here in Revelation chapter 17. Demonstrating what he said was true. But he uses that connector in his texts, to link the events of Revelation 13, verse 18, with a city he is referring to, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 9. The events of chapter 13 is in this city, and the description of who he is referring to in chapter 16, and in chapter 17, is also in the city. So John is not referring to some other city. He is still speaking about the same series of events, in the same city, in these texts. It's one city. John's reference to Babylon as Rome, sitting on seven mountains, is intentionally obfuscated by counter-reformationists, claiming that there are no mountains in Rome. There are only seven hills. When counter-reformationists do that, they are performing their obligatory moral duty to lie for the Roman Catholic Church, as instructed by their saint, John Chrysostom. The chief liar, prophesied by John, earlier in chapter 13. So do not be either shocked or surprised they would be openly and intentionally lying to you. It is their religious duty to do so. Unfortunately, they have an entire religion premised on lying, and they are taught that worshipping those very lies, as God, is a moral duty. So you should not be surprised one of them lie to you. But, neither should you fall for that lie. When John referred to the term, he did so in Greek, not English. And the Greek term, is oros, and refers to an elevation only. And it can mean either hills or mountains. For example, Mount Zion is mentioned 50 times throughout the Bible, and 7 times in the New Testament choosing the same Greek word. If you have ever been to Jerusalem, you will not see a mountain. You might not even notice you are on a hill once you go into Old Jerusalem. 
you might see a sign marking the general area, but other than that, you will not see a Mount Zion mountain anywhere in Jerusalem, other than a hill. This is what Americans think that mountains look like. Primarily because this is what the American use of the language developed into. But, this is what the use of the term actually referred to in the context of the Middle East. Secondly, counter-reformationists that make these kinds of arguments know full well they are openly lying to you. But they simply hope that the obfuscation distracts you long enough to drop the topic and also hoping that in the process you will feel like you are stupid and they are smart instead of just being a bold-faced liar. John's use of the terminology of mountains is the standard first century usage and are taken verbatim from Roman historians, poets and authors that describe the city of Rome as being founded on seven mountains. No one in Christ's day was calling any other city the city of seven mountains but Romans were calling Rome that. In fact, they have an annual Roman feast dedicated to the celebration of the seven mountains, called the Septimanium. The word Septimanium is made up of two Latin words, Septi, meaning seven, and Manium, meaning mountain. And Rome itself was referred to, in writing, as the Septem Urbis Montes, which means the city of seven mountains. From Classical Philology, Volume 1, Number 1, January 1906, page 69, quote, In the literature of the Ciceronian and Augustan periods there are not infrequent references to the seven hills, or Latin, Septem Montes, of the city of Rome. Ted Willis 11.5.55 writes, Now gather the bulls from the seven mountains, while there are already large ones here it will be a city place. Vero de Lingual Gitina verse 41, says, Septimanium nominatum from so many mountains which afterwards the city included, and the day of Septimanium named after these seven mountains on which city is situated. All Ascalius G14, where he is quoting the opinions of M. Valerius Masalic Ravinus, consul in 53 BC, speaks of the Septem Urbis Montes, in such a way as to show, that Masala used the term as an ordinary designation for Rome in his day. End quote. Thirdly, in order to get out of the very clear identification of Rome, as both the seat of the prophesied Antichrist, of whom John absolutely did prophesy, and as Babylon, the city seated upon the seven mountains, they attempt to obfuscate this text by claiming cities with seven hills are all over the world, so there is no reason to think John's prophecy is about Rome. The very fact that they are having to lie about all these things, demonstrates very clearly, they are the deceivers both Christ, and his apostles, prophesied about in the New Testament. Otherwise, they would have nothing to lie about. But lie, is indeed, what they will habitually do. Especially when it comes to those seven hills. Which they absolutely, cannot resist, telling a good lie, about. If you listen to them, John didn't even know, who on earth, he was prophesying about. After all, every other city on earth, according to them, has seven hills. See, Rome is cleared. But this argument is about as stupid as, thinking professional wrestling is real, and the weekly world news tabloid, really found a bad boy. If you modify the description with just one other mentioned item, the chance it will give you another city is reduced to zero. It is the mathematical principle that is used in lottery drawings, and security passcodes. If you have one single digit number, there is a 1 out of 10% chance of being right, but if you add one more number, 10 is suddenly multiplied by 10, which becomes 1 out of 100. If you add a third numeric requirement, it then becomes 1 out of 1000. If your weather forecaster tells you the chance of rain is 0.0001%, you probably won't be taking an umbrella with you that day. Seven Hills, is not the only identifier John uses to describe his target in Revelation chapter 17. The cities that were intentionally founded from the beginning, with seven hills, are much smaller they cite as examples or show on their lists, and for the ones that did brag of being founded on seven mountains or hills, for the most part, they were simply imitating Rome, in order to be like Rome. But none of these alternate cities, are said by John, to be ruling over the kings of the land, in 95 AD. In the present tense, and despite the attempt at obfuscations, over seven hills, or seven mountains, most of these cities did not originally have seven hills, or mountains. 
They are in most examples, simply citing the growth of the cities, that now include seven hills or mountains, which would be true, for just about any major city on the planet now, with the hilly or mountainous terrain. And they ignore the truth, that in many of their own example cases of cities, with seven hills, that they point to, there are, actually more, than seven hills within them. But these cities in 95 AD, were not called the Septem Urbis Montes. There was only one city on Earth, in 95 AD, by that name. The more descriptions you add to the seven mountains, the less likely that it refers to any other place on Earth, besides Rome. If you include, just two of those many items, and nothing more, in the immediate one chapter, the list gets narrowed down, to just one, as you can see in the chart, on your screen. In the case of the city that sits on the seven hills of Rome, John emulated the example of his teacher, Christ. Because during the lifetime of John, Rome had just published a new coinage denomination, shortly after 79 AD, only a few years earlier, during the reign of Vespasian. Vespasian was the Roman emperor, responsible for the genocides that leveled Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple, thus earning its original epitaph, as Babylon. The coin design featured the bust of Vespasian on the front side, and on the back side of the coin, the deity mother of Rome, Roma, is seated to the right, on the seven hills, with the wolf and the Romulian twins to left, next to Tiber River. These coins were in common circulation, and issued in copper, brass and silver, during the composition of the Book of Revelation. They were reissued in a second edition in 108 AD, and again in 193 AD. Never be conned, by a counter-reformationist, over the lie, that Babylon did not mean Rome. It was stamped infamously, on the common circulating coinage, of John's very own day. Conclusion What is so strikingly sad, about counter-reformationists, is watching them blatantly and openly lie out of moral obligation, to deflect any mention of Rome, from the prophecies in Revelation, when even the Romans themselves, have admitted, contrary to their counter-reformation defendants, these references are clearly about, their own, city of Rome. Thus, the expression, at the beginning of this video, you will hear it from the horse's mouth, which was explained as an idiomatic expression in English, meaning the primary source, in this case referring to, primary source documentation. If even first century Jews and Romans alike both openly said these things. Both from New Testament Jews, who actually authored the scriptures, and the early Romans, and Roman Catholics themselves, who subsequently read them, and themselves pointed it to Rome. Then what is motivating the claim, that no one knows what it refers to, or that it is somehow mysterious? Among these sources, other than the actual New Testament, that you have previously examined, there is also the testimony of the Romans themselves. As an example, secular historians frequently cite the fifth book of the Sibylline Oracles, as proof of this usage. So what is the fifth book of the Sibylline Oracles, and what is its relationship to the city of Rome? The following information was generated by AI, GPT, Chat 3.5, and reads as follows, quote, the Sibylline Oracles are a collection of ancient prophetic texts attributed to various Sibyls, who were supposed to be prophetesses or seers, in antiquity. The Sibylline Oracles, are typically divided into several books or sections, and the dating and authorship can vary between them. The fifth book of the Sibylline Oracles, known as Sibylline Oracles Book 5, is generally believed to have been composed during the 2nd century CE, which is a range from 100 AD through 200 AD. Many Roman leaders, including emperors, were familiar with the Sibylline Oracles. The Sibylline Oracles were considered important prophetic texts in the ancient world, and they were consulted by Roman authorities for guidance in times of crisis and for religious purposes. Roman officials and emperors would consult the Sibylline Oracles during various significant events. The Senate of Rome, had a role in the preservation and interpretation, of the Sibylline Oracles, and they were considered an important part, of the religious and political life, of the Roman Empire. End quote. In Book 5, verse 215, the author, is shown in extra-biblical literature, equating Babylon with the city of Rome. 
The authorship is considered to have been possibly written, as early as 100 AD and shows the common association between Babylon and Rome, that the term elicited. As mentioned, the Sibylline oracles were known quote, by Roman authorities for guidance in times of crisis and for religious purposes. End quote. Verse 215 of Book 5 reads as follows, quote, The vasty deep, and Babylon itself, and the land of Italy, because of which, there perished many holy faithful men. End quote. In this text, the capital of the land of Italy, is called Babylon, instead of Rome. Demonstrating the common knowledge association, of the term, for Rome. Aside from such secular or extra-biblical sources, demonstrating common usage of the term Babylon to mean Rome, there is also the very founders of the Roman Catholic Church, and its theology, itself. Quote, Tertullian, in Latin, Quintus Septimius Florens Tertullianus, who lived from 155 AD to 220 AD, was a prolific early Christian author from Carthage in the Roman province of Africa. He was the first Christian author to produce an extensive corpus of Latin Christian literature. Tertullian has been called the father of Latin Christianity, as well as the founder of Western theology. Tertullian originated new theological concepts and advanced the development of early church doctrine. He is perhaps most famous for being the first writer in Latin known to use the term Trinity, in Latin, Trinitas. End quote. Tertullian's impact was so important, that he is literally called, the father of Latin Christianity, and, the founder of Western theology, by theological historians. This is what he said about John's use of Babylon in the book of Revelation. Quote, by a similar usage, Babylon also, in our John, is a figure of the city of Rome, as being like great and proud royal power, and boring down the saints of God. End quote. Another Catholic saint, who has been credited with the most influential Catholic, early writings, on prophecy in the book of Revelation, was Victorinus. Victorinus was the Nicolaitan bishop, Catholic, Saint Victorinus. Victorinus was cited by both Jerome and Origen, and wrote several works, exclusively in Latin. Victorinus said in, his commentary on the Apocalypse, quote, The seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman sitteth. That is the city of Rome. End quote. The official early church historian, of the Roman Catholic Church, referred to as the father of church history, Eusebius of Caesarea, stated in Book 2, his church history, that quote, Peter himself, indicates this, referring to the city, as to the city of Rome figuratively, as Babylon. End quote. The Encyclopedia Britannica states, quote, Augustine is perhaps the most significant Christian thinker after Saint Paul. He adapted classical thought to Christian teaching and created a powerful theological system of lasting influence. He also shaped the practice of biblical exegesis and helped lay the foundation for much of medieval and modern Christian thought. End quote. Catholics refer to Augustine as Saint Augustine, despite the plain historical fact he was another fraudulent Nicolaitan, masquerading as a bishop, despite his disqualification for that title. In Augustine's role as a professional excuse maker, Augustine needed some very good ones, because he had justified the Thessalonian massacres, and personally corresponded with Pope Sixtus III, which bore the name of the actual prophesied Antichrist. A prophecy that he himself, had been fully aware of. Despite these facts, and his lengthy professional excuse making for the Roman Empire, and its obvious elevation of a man by the name of Three Sixes, to the position of Bishop of Rome, even Augustine in his voluminous City of God identifies Rome as Babylon, stating, quote, It may appear how Babylon, like a first Rome, ran its course along with the City of God. And quote, Ought to be taken mostly from the Greek and Latin kingdoms, where Rome herself is like a second Babylon. End quote. The recognition that Babylon had been a clear reference to Rome, was not even controversial for centuries. It was accepted, as the fact that it was, even by Catholic priests, who embraced Augustine's claim, that the proper interpretation of Revelation was purely allegorical and referred to the heavenly realm, versus the earthly realm, in ambiguous generalities, and devoid of any specifics. But Catholic priests and even lay Catholic believers, themselves, never really universally accepted that claim. Realizing that the teaching of the New Testament, was invariably tied to prophetic descriptions about the city of Rome. And it was not just from the book of Revelation, as is commonly claimed. From the year 900 AD, 
it was noted that the Bishop of Treves, faced trial over calling the Pope of Rome, quote, the Antichrist, yea, a wolf, and Rome, Babylon, end quote. There in that charge, was the Bishop of Treves, cited the teaching of Christ, warning of the coming of wolves among the sheep, from Matthew 7. Peter Waldo, who lived from 1140 AD to 1205 AD, originally named, Pierre Vons, de Vox, or in Latin, Petrus Waldus, Valdus, who created the first copy of the Bible in vernacular language, also realized the prophetic implications of Roma's Babylon, and spoke of them as early as 300 years before the Lutheran Reformation. Quote, extant sources relate that he was a wealthy clothier and a merchant from Lyon and a man of some learning. After establishing himself as a successful merchant, Waldo commissioned monks to create a translated copy of the Bible for him. The clerics from Lyon translated the New Testament into the vernacular Romance Franco-Provencal. This has caused Waldo to be credited with providing to Europe the first translation of the Bible in a modern tongue outside of Latin. End quote. In Early English Texts, online, the work of Benjamin Keach, 1640-1704, records, quote, of this last opinion were the ancient Waldenses who felt the bloody power of Rome, venting itself in most horrid and barbarous cruelties against them, and that for a long series of time, as appears by our most authentic, ancient, and modern writers, who give a very ample account of the great persecution of Christians for many hundred years. To which opinion of the Waldenses, most of our modern Protestant divines agree, of which we shall mention only Cartwright, Falk, the worthily admired, and learned Mead, not forgetting famous Du Moulin of France, as may be seen in their works at large. End quote. None of this is really even controversial, even among Roman Catholic priests, because it was the claim that Babylon did refer to Rome, that numerous Catholic writings, were produced. One of which was the Shepherd of Hermes, a revelatory vision, accepted as sacred texts, in early Rome, believed, or reported to have written by the brother of the Bishop of Rome, which most modern historians, consider legendary. In The Shepherd of Hermas, the author states, quote, The tower, which thou seest building, is myself, the church, which was seen of thee both now and aforetime. Ask, therefore, what thou willest concerning the tower, and I will reveal it unto thee, that thou mayest rejoice with the saints. End quote. Throughout the Shepherd of Hermas, it can be seen, that the Biblical Tower of Babel, or Babylon, is reinterpreted, not as rebellion against God, but a task to be completed by the quote-unquote, saints of God demonstrating the typical flip of the script, in standard Nicolaitan theology, which continues all the way up into modern Roman Catholicism. In the lecture to the University of Cambridge of 1848, Cardinal Bellarmin is quoted from his own expositions on Revelation, entitled Disputations de Controversies, admitting the fact that, quote, Cardinal Bellarmin, calls Rome Babylon, quote, for no other city besides Rome reigned in his age over the kings of the earth, and it is well known that Rome was seated upon seven hills, end quote. The significance of citing Cardinal Bellarmin, who was subsequently elevated to the Catholic sainthood in 1930, was that he had been a chief antagonist, against Protestantism, in the 1500s, during the time of Martin Luther, and promulgated the now held commonly propagandized position, of Jesuit Futurism. Bellarmin, was one of the architectural sources, of that now, commonly believed in, Jesuit propaganda. As you saw earlier, that not only did Rome admit the reference in Revelation was clearly and unmistakably admitted to be Rome, but that there had been a theological flip of the script taken from Nicolaitanism, that interpreted Babylon, as the source of their religion, and this was taken as being actually from God, not his antithesis. This view continued unbroken from its earliest inception, straight into the modern era. Cardinal Newman is another very revered source among Catholic theology, freely admitted in his writing of essay on the development of the Christian religion, quote, the temples, incense, oil lamps, votive offerings, holy water, holidays, seasons of devotion, processions, blessings of the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure of priests, monks, nuns, images, and statues are all of pagan origin, end quote. Meaning of course, that these origins were anything but biblical, Jewish, or apostolic, so describing all this, by the term apostolic, was patently, an open case of, Nicolaitan, opposite speak. An openly admitted, 
flip of the script, or in this case, a flip of the scriptures, into what it openly condemned. An intentional act of rebellion. Precisely as Mystery Babylon, or Spiritual Babelism, is described in the Old and New Testaments. In closing, this video opened with the claim, that you were going to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, when it came to the subject of Babylon. And all the previous citations, from the New Testament itself, to John's revelation, who coined the most famous use of that metaphor, to the 1st and 2nd century Jews and Romans who both used, understood accepted, and admitted that allusion, demonstrate clearly, that the language and grammar of the New Testament, was unmistakable. But now, in closing, you are once again, going to hear it, from the horse's mouth. Only this time, from the Catholic, patron saint of horses, Catholic Saint, Hippolytus, who was not only the patron saint of horses, he is also described as the most important theologian of the church in the third century. Hippolytus said, quote, Tell me, blessed John, apostle and disciple of the Lord, what didst thou see and hear concerning Babylon? Arise and speak. For it, Rome, sent thee also into banishment. End quote. In the next video, you will see the attempts, at dishonestly deflecting that reference to other cities, including Jerusalem and Washington. What is motivating that deflection, and why it will always be utterly wrong. And we will also touch on why spiritual babelism, is a very real danger that can threaten the eternal destiny of any Christian, no matter what their religion might be, or lack thereof. Don't miss the next episode, in our continuing unveiling of the seventh and last, saucer judgment, in chapter 16. Thank you for watching.